Yeah, I get both the luxury of coming at the end of the day, so everyone has already given the kind of theoretical, methodological groundwork for what I'm going to present, and also the, uh, uh, the unenviable task of keeping you awake at the end of the day. So hopefully you've had lots of coffee. Um, <clears throat> the, the talk of my presentation seems to be changing all the time. So um, I originally called it social attention in and at the movies. Um, another way of rethinking of this is basically people watching people watching people. Uh, so people watching squared. Uh, essentially, what I do is I watch, you watch, people in movies. Um, and that's the research that I'm actually looking at. So it gets to some of the, the topics which have already been up about social attention um, uh, in natural scenes, and in this context, in media. Um, of course, you can even go further. If we're watching um, uh, Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window, where are people watching people watching people watching people watching people, um, which happens all the time in movies. <laughs> and if anybody's into kind of the... Uh, gender politics of cinema, that's a big topic of interest, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, the, other talk, uh, the other title which is down here is uh, Eye Tracking in the Wild and in Film. Um, mostly what I'm going to be talking about is um, the role of visual attention in movie watching, uh, but my broader research is trying to look at how we use um, overt attention and that's very specifically what I'm talking about here. So we're looking at eye movements as a, as a record of where um, attention is overtly oriented or likely to be oriented um, in naturalistic scenes and the factors that actually play a role in this. Um, and just to kind of show you that we can do this, uh, although it's incredibly complex, this is footage from a head-mounted eye tracker. Uh, this is the SMI glasses. Uh, and this is a six-year-old girl who's using it. And uh, it's just a pilot. There's no experimental paradigm here. It's just showing what she's actually looking at. Um, and you can see the, how dynamic the gaze is, how rapidly it's moving around the image, um, how she, when she's moving, when her head's moving, everything really complex is going on. And so a lot of our basic assumptions about how do you define eye movements, how do you find fixations, saccades, how do you interpret the actual perceptual processes happening during those, uh, become infinitely more complex when you take away the controls. So everything that's been said today about good experimental design, good comparison of conditions as a way of getting at what's happening uh, are really important. Um, and uh, also, if anybody's got motion sickness watching this, um, <laughs> it gives you a good sense of how um, visual stability, how saccadic suppression, uh, and how the gaze is very important for actually stabilizing against head and body movements. Um, so this is what's actually happening, and some of the uh, students in my lab are starting to research in face-to-face -face interactions, but that's early days. Um, and so in order, as a way of understanding how visual attention works in complex dynamic scenes, um, that kind of got me interested in film, and vice versa, film got me more interested in how we attend to complex real-world scenes. Um, as uh, Catherine was saying, I uh, started out researching, um, psych uh, studying psychology in conjunction with cognitive science and computational work, uh, and I realised that there was big lacks of, uh, uh, there was a big gap in understanding. A lot of um, the research that I was learning about visual perception and visual attention was using very um, controlled stimuli. Um, but in the kind of computational side, there was a lot of attempts to create kind of computational systems, robotics, which could deal with the real world. Um, and I also knew as a side interest from uh, my passion in film and being an amateur filmmaker and reading film literature, that there was an immense amount of insight into uh, human visual experience that filmmakers seem to have intuited and have actually operationalized in the way that they make films. Um, and so my research has been trying to reconcile those three areas. Um, and why do I think film is a really powerful medium for looking at that? Because, um, as uh, uh, Josh established at the beginning, we can think of film as a, a, a communication medium. We have a filmmaker or a team of, of filmmakers who want to communicate ideas, experiences, affective states to an audience. And if you're working in mainstream cinema or mainstream TV, you want to optimize that for as large an audience as possible. So I want to get my... Pet, my um, my message across to you. And I do it through the medium. And all I can craft is the sound and the image that's projected on the screen. So I have to put, I have to make decisions about what I put on the screen in a way that it can maximize the chance that everybody in the audience is going to be looking in the same place, perceiving the same thing, comprehending the same narrative, and hopefully being moved and take away the same information from it. And in order to do that, they have to have an insight into the actual medium itself and its effect on the viewer. So um, what we have to do, or one of the approaches I take, is to look in the actual the filmmaking literature and see what intuitions we can extract, and then can we then start testing them. 
Um, and so there's lots of wonderful quotes from masters of the form, like uh, Steven Spielberg, um, that seem to suggest that they believe they have this power over the, uh, the audience. Uh, this is a quote from a Sunday Times article when he was actually saying that even today, he goes to the multiplex and he watches movies himself. He says he sneaks in after um, the trailers, who wears a baseball cap so people don't get distracted by the fact that the director of the movie is sat next to them. Um, and he sits down, and then he says he becomes one of the audience. All of us go into a kind of lockstep, where if we were watching a tennis match, you'd see that perfect synchronicity of heads, going left, right, left, right. The same thing in a movie theatre. When the movie is working, the audience is galvanised, almost hypnotised, all watching the same thing, all knowing where to look at exactly the same time. It's a wonderful thing, there's nothing greater than that. Um, it's a wonderful quote about the power of cinema. It's also a great sense of how egotistical he is, because he's basically packing himself in the back. <laughs> and I, also, I can do this. I can make you all think the same thing and have the same experience. Um, so do we actually do this? When we're watching a movie, are we all looking at it in exactly the same way at the same time? Um, well, long story short, yes. Um, this is eye movements. Um, each one of these uh, little eyes is the raw gaze location of uh, 48 participants. They're watching this movie um, on an eye link eye tracker. It's not the most naturalistic viewing conditions. They've got their head on a chin rest and they're sat there on a tiny computer screen. Uh, we, we do have uh, nicer, more um, non-invasive eye trackers, but this gives us really nice precise data. Again, the issue of making sure you minimize the, the noise as, as much as possible. And what you'll see is they're just previewing this um, clip of a um, cookery show. Oops. They should induce a warming sensation, reduce some of the pain, and also reduce the inflammation. So they work in three So what you ways. find when you get people so we've previewing got about 200 highly grams composed, of chilies here, pretty finely chopped, essentially we're going to make a tea but out of the chilies. Um, when people are previewing highly composed, highly edited um, film or TV sequences like this, the gaze usually occupies about a 5% portion of the screen area for the majority of the viewing time. The gaze will be highly clustered, spontaneous across individuals, seemingly irrespective of um, individual differences or various sort of things that the participants are bringing to the task. Um, and you can see how rapidly they're shifting around, trying to track what they deem to be the areas of interest in the shot. Um, most of the shots are actually they're really focused on one single point of the screen, and then only occasionally do you get fragmentation when they're looking in different places. Um, so what I'm going to do at the start of the talk is actually to talk about the intuitions that filmmakers have, um, have had and have formalized as a way of actually maximizing this probability that you're all going to look in the same place at the same time. Um, also, just because it's been discussed already, I call this phenomenon of attentional synchrony. This is a presumption on my part that attention is correlated with uh, gaze location. Um, and in studies that we've tried to do to validate this, if I do things like uh, change blindness during these tasks or if I probe um, short or long-term memory for content, um, it's predicted by the fixation location or your eccentricity from fixation. But that doesn't exclude the possibility that, that there are other dimensions of attention, so changing the weighting of attention through arousal or covert <coughs> attention, which is operating in it. But just as a shorthand, I am going to make that slight um, error of using gaze and attention interchangeably. But film hasn't always been this way. Um, when film as a medium started, so in the late uh, 19th century, you've got the Lumiere brothers and Edison were innovating with the techniques of actually capturing moving images. And this is the famous uh, video which apparently set people in Paris running and screaming from the uh, cinema. Uh, in actual fact, they never did that. It was a marketing campaign to try to show how cool moving images were. Um, first, the first films were actuality films. You put a camera on a tripod somewhere, you film real life. People are fascinated by the fact that they can see something they're not physically um, present with. Uh, and a lot of these were, um, it's lots of people, it's lots of traffic scenes, it's spectacles they haven't seen themselves. Uh, they're basically moving postcards. Very quickly, audiences got bored of that. Um, and so then the, uh, the filmmakers had to come up with something else. Um, so you have filmmakers like uh, Georges Méliès, who came out of the tradition of vaudeville and stage magic, where they realized that film is a great way of documenting their performances so they can actually maximize the audience for it. And they also then started to realize that the form itself affords new modes of communication. Um, so he was using trick 
uh, photography where you, it's implied that it's a single camera perspective, single continuous scene, but by stopping the footage, changing the image, or doing some multiple imposition of the same frame, you can create some magic tricks that he wouldn't have been able to do in reality. Um, so already, uh, very early, since 1896, so just at the beginning of film, he's realizing that the medium itself allows you to do stuff that you couldn't do in reality. And the, the, the main technique he's using is editing. That's fantastic. Um, so easy to do, and it really exploits the fact that you're, you're trying to record something in this serial medium, which can be um, chopped up and re-manipulated to change someone's perception. And then, very quickly, this is a, a good example from Buster Keaton in 1920, but uh, about a decade or so earlier than that, editing had started to liberate the image. I create really nice, dramatic, fast-paced sequences where all of a sudden the audience is transported from one viewpoint, one location to another, and the narrative is developing over time and space through the medium in a way that it never could have actually accomplished in theatre because of the constraints of the actual set. So they were starting to experiment with the form. But as soon as they um, cut, they realised that they were introducing something which seems to be incredibly artificial and should draw attention to the form itself. So uh, here, one of the earliest cuts to a close-up from um, J. Smith's The Sick Kitten in 1903, you've got this comedy scene of a young girl who's trying to feed um, medicine to her cat, and the whole point of the scene is that the cat doesn't want to be fed medicine. Um, but due to the, the low resolution of the film stock at that time, the low frame rate in which it was actually captured, the image is hugely degraded. It's even more degraded here, you can't really see the details of it. Um, but what you need is to get in and actually focus on and get things in more detail. Um, so how do you do that? We, if you were in the real scene, you'd walk up, you'd move your eyes to it, you'd get closer, you'd try to increase the information you could look at. So you move the camera closer and you cut to a close-up detail of the scene. You're trying to overcome the limitations of the viewer's visual, uh, 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 the viewer's visual capacity as a way of actually maximizing the communication of the stimulus. Um, but you want to do it in a way where the cut itself doesn't lead to miscommunication. So you want to make sure that the cut doesn't become highly salient. It's a sudden whole field change of the visual scene. I go from having this scene of two people against the backdrop to all of a sudden the entire visual field is, is different from seeing a cat. How can I cut in a way that that isn't unnatural to the viewers? Um, and over the subsequent decades, filmmakers um, started to standardise ways in which they would actually do this. Um, to the point where uh, Rees and Miller, uh, the British director Carol Rees, in 1953 in his handbook on film direction, says that um, one of the main principles as an editor is that making a smooth cut means you join together two shots in such a way that the transition does not create a noticeable jerk and the spectator's illusion of seeing continuous motion is not interrupted. You are trying to give them the perception of something being continuous through discontinuity. So how are they doing this, and why is it working? <clears throat> um, so I haven't got time to go into all of the heuristics and the techniques they use. I'm just going to touch on two main areas and how we can actually validate them uh, by looking at how people watch natural scenes. So if you open a Film 101 book, any textbook which is an introduction to film, analysis, or filmmaking, um, you will find these kind of heuristics. Um, let's have a show of hands. Who here ha has like a specialism, either an interest or a practice in film? Okay. Hopefully this is familiar for you. Um, so, okay, this is the first principle. Most of what I'm going to talk about is, you can think about happening in the edit suite. It's the construction of a visual scene through edited sequences joined over time, uh, received by the audience at the end. But that stimuli has to come from somewhere. It has to come from the decision of where did the filmmaker put the camera, stage the action, frame the shot, what did they capture and what didn't they capture. Um, and you do that using the, uh, the system uh, broadly called the Hollywood system or the continuity editing system, um, or uh, adhering to the 180 degree rule. The 180 degree rule says that if I'm representing an action, which is usually depicted by two people in interaction, which is important. Um, that, that interaction establishes an axis. So here it's them looking at each other, it's them talking, or it's them physically interacting. That axis has to be maintained. 
So when I start shooting the scene um, from a shot which is typically a bit further away, um, either if this is a medium shot or even a further long shot, I've established various things about the, what's going to happen in the rest of the scene. So I've established that um, Mr. Orange is on the left and Mr. Blue is on the right. Um, and that establishes this axis and the arc. I can then cut to any position on this side of the axis of action, and it will be seen as, having, uh, as being acceptable in terms of the viewer's uh, perceptual understa uh, spatial understanding of the scene. If I was to cut from E over to E, uh, A over to E2, from here to here, all of a sudden Mr. Orange is on the wrong side of the screen and he's looking in the wrong direction. So film editors believe that would lead to a jerk, they would become more aware of the editing themselves, and it would bring them out of this kind of fluid uh, perception of the action. The language I'm using so far is the editor's language, and it's the kind of thing you'll find in textbooks. And it already implies a psychological uh, motivation from the perspective of the audience. Another technique, um, this is about kind of camera placement and sequencing. This is more about when do you cut. Um, so if I want to cut from a medium shot of this woman doing the very exciting action of putting a cup down on a saucer, uh, to a close-up of that. The best time to do it is just after she started the movement. And then you continue the movement in the next shot. If I did it after the action had happened, or before she even started the action, you're, the filmmakers believe that your awareness of this cut itself will be increased, and you'll be distanced um, from the actual action. So these are basic principles. Can we see why these may be um, in the way that we actually uh, perceive real scenes? Uh, and before we do that, can we check whether they actually worked? So these were um, insights that filmmakers had, and they've, they've been there, they've been documented since the early 1920s as actually being present in film. We saw the, the cut to close up in 1903. Um, David Bordwell, uh, who's done a lot of work on documenting the history of this, says that basically by about 1918, there were established conventions that were being used broadly. And they've been through various iterations over time, as we'll see later. But the basic principles are still there. Um, so do they work? Well, this is a, a little behavioral task that I did where we showed participants uh, film sequences from Hollywood movies, from international movies, from, um, from more uh, experimental movies. But within them, they all had moments where they adhered to these types of conventions of editing. Uh, and all the participants have to do is they're watching this movie, and they've just got to click a button every time they see a cut. And we train them what a cut is and then they watch these movies, and we try to get them to actually detect the cuts. Um, and do, do the cuts that um, adhere to the continuity rules, do they minimize uh, awareness of the actual cut itself? So as a comparison, uh, we've got uh, between scene cuts where there's no continuity between them. So this is a shot from um, uh, Blade Runner. Uh, this is Decker, who's flying his way to a, um, uh, to a new scene, and then there's a cut to a wholly different visual scene. So there's no visual relationship between this. You're not really sure what the temporal, the spatial relationship is. So it's said to not have continuity. Um, you compare that to within scene cuts. Sorry, these are so dark. Um, you've got two people in conversation, and then you cut to an over-the-shoulder shot of one of them um, responding to one. Or you've got a match on action, where the same character's movement starts in one shot and then continues in the next. She's moving across the frame. Um, if you just tell them to respond and detect the actual cuts, they miss about 8% of the between scene cuts, but they miss significantly more, it's up to about 25% of the within scene cuts, um, and they miss a third of all of the match action cuts. Um, so this technique that the editors believe were effectively making the cuts invisible a third of the time, it was meaning that they were missing this whole thing. And this is the whole screen, it's occupied by a video. Their only task is to push a button when they see the change. Um, and just by having this transition here meant that they would miss a third of them. Um, now, those empiricists in the audience will see that this is not a good design, because this is not the same as that, blah, blah, blah. I haven't controlled all these factors. But we've repeated this uh, a couple of times where we actually have these sequences, and we, we basically keep the images exactly the same, but we manipulate when the cut happens to change the timing, basically breaking the match action cut. And these effects either appear or disappear, depending on whether we keep the, the motion there. So we can, we can actually validate that the filmmakers are doing what they think they're doing, is they're minimizing our awareness of the form and maybe maximizing uh, the perception of the actual action which is depicted. So um, from this, 
for my PhD and beyond, I was developing um, what I call an attentional theory of cinematic continuity, uh, the idea that this ability for filmmakers to choose choice moments to cut and know what to cut to in order to simplify our perception of dynamic scenes um, was built on an assumption that they knew where people were going to attend and how attention shifts in the natural scene. If they can match, if they can match the way that we attend to and construct a representation of the dynamic scene through editing, <coughs> then, their rep then showing an edited sequence would enable us to simply perceive the content. Um, and this is an idea which is adapted from early theorists, including uh, Hugo Munsterberg in his um, book in 1916, when he was talking about already in the very beginnings of experimental psychology, how he thought the film is incredibly insightful to the uh, human mind. Um, if anybody's interested in the more expanded theory and all the assumptions and how we can test them, uh, please have a look at my uh, projections paper. I don't have time to go into it all right now, so I want to focus on just some aspects of it. So the first question is, filmmakers have to be able to know where you're looking. If they know where they're looking, they can show you that, and they can show you at the time that you would normally look there. So how can they do that? Um, well, it's not just uh, filmmakers that have this ability. Magicians and tricksters have had this for centuries. There's a great, uh, uh, I think it's Hermes Bosch, um, mm -hmm. showing an actual uh, a street magi a magician who's distracting someone's attention whilst his, uh, his accomplice is uh, pickpocketing the uh, member of the audience. And it's great power for people to actually have this insight. And it's also a social ability to be able to understand how other people are attending to a scene. Um, and filmmakers use various techniques to, um, to identify what we're looking at and then also to shape it within the actual frame to make sure that from one shot to another we're going to be looking at a certain part of the image. Um, and there are various techniques they use to do this. Uh, we'll just look at kind of um, image making, so cinematography, set design, lighting. These can be used to actually manipulate the image. And this come out of basic principles from photography and even before that from um, still uh, image composition, painting, and so on. And so they, the assumption is that if you put a spotlight on an object, the thing which is higher luminance will be the thing that you look at. Um, color, higher color contrast, the bolder, the brighter color things are the things which are most likely going to capture attention. Uh, framing, uh, this is very important, so I've taken the slide out, but put a frame around something, you look at what's in the middle of it basically the shorthand. Um, and if you're interested, I can show you data to support that. Uh, this is something which is uh, unique to photography and cinematography, is um, depth of field and focus. If you have a very shallow focus, you think that with a certain choice of lenses, the belief is that you're going to look at the thing which is in focus and that which is not out of focus. And uh, filmmakers will modify this dynamically, so rack focus or pole focus is shifting the focal plane. And the belief is that it's shifting your attention in space. Um, the movement of the camera as well, what you're framing, so actually moving the camera up and down to focus on a certain object, combines all these features dynamically, so that which is at the center is the thing which is they believe you're directing your attention to. Uh, zoom as well, moving the image either physically with the camera or with an optical zoom as a way of um, moving your attention to some particular part of it. Um, editing, of course, is the most important. I've gone from this sequence here um, to something else. So I just cut and say, look at this now. Um, so you couldn't have grabbing your head and putting you down here. Um, but these are all formal elements of, of film. There's also the staging and the choreography of the actual actions themselves. So when you've got people in interaction, there is dynamics of attention within that um, that the filmmakers have to be aware of so that they can choose what's the point to cut and how then to actually focus your attention if they all want you to look in one place at one time. Um, and we can see evidence, or we can find evidence that filmmakers were interested in this relationship between the viewer's attention and how they were telling the stories very early on in filmmaking. So this is a quote from uh, D.W. Griffith, um, sometimes thought as the, um, the father of the feature film, uh, making birth of the nation in the, uh, the late teens. Um, where he says, looking at real things, the human vision fastens itself upon a quick succession of small, comprehensible incidents, and we form our eventual impression like a mosaic out of such detail. The director counterfeits the operation of the eye with his lens. 
He's writing this in the early 20s. Uh, anybody who knows eye tracking knows that Guy Buswell uh, was one of the first pioneers of recording eye movements, did it in the late 20s, early 30s in America. Um, the person that most people attribute to being a pioneer in eye tracking is Alfred Yalbus, who did it in the 60s in Moscow. Um, D.W. Griffiths had never seen eye movements recorded, he'd never seen a scan path, and he was able to intuit this on his own experience and watching other people. And already he had this insight into the dynamics of gaze. Uh, and this is, I love this quote, it's a quote again by Carol Reese in the technique of film editing in 1953. Um, and he's describing the way that he chooses to break down a scene. It says, I may, in the real world, I may suddenly turn a street corner to find a small urchin, thinking himself unobserved, carefully aiming a fragment of rubble at a particularly tempting window. As he throws it, my eyes instinctively and instantly turn to the window to see if he hits it. Immediately after, they return back to the boy again to see what he does next. Perhaps he's just caught sight of, the, of me and grins derisively. Then he looks past me, his expression changes, and he bolts off as fast as his short legs can carry him. I look behind me to discover the policeman has just turned the corner. He's describing a scan path. He's describing his awareness of the scene as being an active construction of attention shifts between different areas. Then when he went on to actually stage, shoot, and edit the scene, he would reproduce that process. He would show a long shot of the scene. He would show a close-up of the urchin as he threw. He'd cut on the, the action as the, as the rock hit the window to see if it, it, it made contact with it. He's saying that his entire motivation for the breaking down of the scene is his or your attention if you were in that scene. So where are we actually looking in dynamic scenes? Um, as, as we saw before, the clustering of gaze in highly composed, highly edited sequences is very tight. Um, but as I said, there's lots of factors for that. Depth of field, lighting, framing, camera movements. They do All of these things are trying to force our attention to one place. Um, if we take away all of those features, including image motion, um, here you've got uh, seven people looking at uh, this photograph. Uh, you can see the scan path, they're moving around, there's certain areas they keep coming back to, there's a boy on a swing here, um, but they're not necessarily looking there at the same time, they're going off and exploring, and over time they get more dispersed on where they're looking. Um, all we have to do is make the scene move, and those individual differences mostly go away. Um, so in this scene, there's one point of motion, it's semantically interested. interesting, you've got uh, two boys, one of them runs off, they follow the motion, there's a bird across the top which they track. Large parts of the image never get fixated. I'm moving my attention to try to um, follow the points of interest when I'm looking at the scene. Uh, so how, do we, how can we identify what's being looked at, how can we predict it? <clears throat> Um, so, I don't need to go over this because it's all been talked about in great detail already by Matthias and by Josh. Um, so, looking at theories of visual attention uh, and visual search, we believe that there are interacting um, operations that are deciding how we're going to attend to any visual scene. Um, there are those about the stimulus itself, where the visual features, for um, various reasons, may actually uh, elicit automatic shifts of attention to them. Um, and then there's endogenous factors. There's factors about us which we bring to it, so individual differences, scene semantics, things which are not immediately present in the low-level processing of the image uh, that we need to actually identify in order to choose where to, uh, uh, to, uh, to look. Um, and these factors may weigh the early ones. So as Mateus was showing, uh, kind of feature-sensitive uh, attention can, can weigh our sensitivity to a particular color, to a particular um, orientation. Um, and the general measure of this is that endogenous is slow. Uh, it is um, very, it's serial, so you have to enlist a process where you can actually search through the candidates in a serial manner, uh, whereas exogenous can be parallel. The stimulus itself will command attention and hopefully minimize individual differences because we all should be subject to those to a similar degree. Um, moving on one layer from that, when we look at this effect, in uh, attentional cueing tasks, the Posner task, which has already been introduced, uh, there's different ways in which we can see these, uh, these operations working. So if we go to this end first, if we've got an endogenous cue, an arrow saying this is where the target is likely to be, um, if that arrow is highly predictive of the actual target location, you'll be quicker at actually finding it. Uh, if it's not predictive of the target location, then you may be no quicker at finding that target. 
So it requires me to invest some belief in that actual target as a way of shifting my attention there voluntarily. Um, whereas if the, uh, the target location flashes, using some very basic low-level features, uh, captures attention to it, it doesn't matter how predictive your attention is, you will always shift towards that object. Um, and here's another way in which attention can be cued, which starts getting to the social dimension uh, that we're interested in in movies, is that we can also find the same thing using ga gaze cueing. If we have a caricatured face at the screen center and the eyes look in one direction, that will increase, that will decrease the speed and increase our accuracy with detecting the target. So we can, as well as using basic low-level features, we can also use social features as a way of cueing attention. Now, whether, um, <coughs> whether this is uh, any better or worse than a normal arrow is a topic for debate, and there's lots of studies to try to look at that. But we do follow gaze uh, in these, uh, these abstract situations, and we do it in the real world as well. Um, how can we test this, um, the exogenous contributions of gaze in a movie, um, well we can either do it by manipulating visual features in the movie to see how it changes my gaze behaviour, or we can leave the movies as they are, and we can get a lot of gaze data on a lot of movies, and we can use computational modelling to account for the low level features in the movies and see how well they predict attention. Um, so this approach is broadly uh, inspired by the idea of visual salience and this attentional landscape. Uh, so Mateus talked about this in terms of the integration of the, the different feature maps as a way of predicting where attention is likely to go. The, the decision about where your eyes go um, comes from sampling from this attentional landscape, which is a representation of your entire visual field. This attentional landscape can be made from basic uh, processing of basic visual features. So I take in the visual information into the uh, primary visual cortex, and all of the individual features are computed. So we have uh, color dimensions, uh, luminance, edge orientations, and other factors such as motion, conjunctions, and stereo disparity. These are represented relatively uh, independently in the early visual cortex. And then they're combined together in some, some way, usually additive, you sum up all these features, um, to create an overall um, salinity map. So this is at a certain point relative to my eye's current location, uh, the relative likelihood that that, or the, the saliency of that point, which tells us the relative likelihood it's going to capture my attention. Um, and all that happens is we have a dumb system where you just go through this landscape sampling the highest point at each moment, shifting your attention between them. Um, now there's another mechanism we need in order to make this happen. If you just sample this landscape, then you look at the, the peak, this first point, which is the red um, phone box on the side of the road, you move your eyes there. You then go to the next highest peak in a, a salinity map. You go to the, uh, the, the traffic sign. And then if you just sampled through the uh, landscape again, you've started here, you've moved here, you look for the highest peak, you go back to the same location. And you just keep oscillating between those. So that's where the mechanism inhibition of return that Matthias mentioned um, can, uh, comes into play in these models, you inhibit where you've been before, meaning you constantly sample down the locations. And in this interpretation, that's all, mod all eye movements are, it's basically a serial search through this attentional landscape. Um, now, I will say, at this point, this is one model, and it's one which has been tested and queried in great depth. Um, so, can we use this approach? Can we extract the visual features from visual scenes? And can we see how well they account for actual fixation location? Um, there's been a lot of work doing this with static scenes. So if we just take one of my still images and we get people to move their eyes around it, uh, do the visual, does the visual saliency predict where people are gonna look in a static scene? Um, yes, the saliency at the points which are fixated is higher than we predicted by chance, but um, that can be easily negated by changing viewing condition, changing scene semantics, or if you take into account really stupid things like um, the fact the gaze is generally biased towards the screen center. And the, the individual contribution of saliency in a static scene is very low, uh, and it's generally uh, less than will be predicted by um, being able to represent some kind of object level of the scene, the things which are relevant to the viewing task. 
But what about in moving images? Uh, in movies, when you do the same kind of computational prediction of eye movements, you start to get uh, significantly reliable predictions of gaze location. Um, so various labs have done this, including Lauren Itty's lab, uh, Michael Dorr, and um, myself and my students. Um, complex, quite complex to do this, but basically um, we take every frame of uh, all of our movies in this, uh, in this sample, you process it, you break it down into individual feature dimensions, you turn each of those into a probability map, and then you take the gaze location and you pack that back onto the same frame, uh, same frame, and you compare what's the likelihood that that fixation is accounted for by that feature dimension more than a control distribution of gaze. Um, so you have to have the gaze elsewhere on the image as a way of seeing that it's, uh, it's not just due to the fact that the whole image is brighter, but that point that you're looking at is brighter than everything else. Uh, and when you do that, we use a um, uh, signal detection method uh, where it can compute a value where 1 means that it's highly predicted by that individual feature and 0 0.5 would mean it's chance, it's not predicted by that feature. And as you do that, basic things like brightness and colour are non-predictive of gaze location. But as you start adding in the more complex features and specifically uh, optic flow, these motion dimensions, you're starting to account for about 70% of the variance in gaze. And it's cumulative, so it's, you're adding it all up? No, no, these are individual channels. Oh, okay. Um, so if we build a salinity map, which is a weighted contribution of these, we can get much higher. Um, and that's what uh, Laura Itty and his colleagues have done. He can put that all of it into a model. But what you find is that the, the single greatest contribution overall is the motion channel. Uh, and so here we've got 0.7 prediction of gaze location. And I don't have the graph here, but if we also, if we take into account how clustered the gaze is, so we find the moments where there's most attentional synchrony, this prediction goes up to about 80%. So when people are all looking in the same place, they're looking at a point in the image which has more motion than the overall um, motion in the image itself. Um, so in a moving image, as you could see from the, uh, the playground example before, my gaze is highly correlated where the points of motion are in the image. And relating this back to the editing intuition, if I put this scene through my, um, my feature detector, uh, and it was just looking for motion, what we get is high, we get um, a high point of motion contrast around the hand as it's moving. Um, so this is standing out in that single feature dimension, which is the point at which the director is saying move and cut to a new perspective. We did it after or before, it doesn't have that point of motion contrast, meaning it's not going to be predictive of where I'm looking. We can see a sense of that if I just give you the motion. So this is a heat map which represents how much motion is, is in each pixel of a source video um, at this particular frame. It's been blurred a little bit, which is why it's kind of soft, but this is what goes into our computational uh, model. And what I want to see if you can spot is what's, um, what is depicted in this video. So all you're seeing is the motion. See if anybody can spot it and I give some hints. Yes. Who did that? Uh, it's an edited. Uh, so here we've got the, the backwards and forwards of the two players. There's a cut. There's one of them just rolled on the floor because he missed. Um, and then the camera will cut back. He's about to serve. Now it's from a low angle shot. And the other player's over there in the distance. Now it cuts a long shot. You can see them running backwards and forwards along the baseline. Um, so you basically, by just following the motion, it's got rid of all the background details. And it's just shown uh, the edges in motion. And this is where people are looking when watching the same sequence. Uh, this is uh, John McEnroe versus Bjorn Borg in the first Wimbledon final when he won. Uh, and this is McEnroe down here who keeps throwing himself on the floor because he's a big girl. Um, and what you can see is that when they're playing it, the attention is highly correlated with the points which are in motion. The ball goes up, you serve it, it follows across the court. So much so that it almost looks like they're playing tennis with the gaze. So it's going backwards and forwards in the same way that Spielberg was talking about. Um, and so what we need to do is find the motion and we can predict where gaze is going to be. But what this also demonstrates is that it may not be the motion that we're looking at, but that the motion is correlated with something else of interest. And in this situation, as in most of our videos, um, the, the points of high motion are the people and they're the people in interaction. 
So this may actually be a correlation due to the social features in the scene, which we're seeking out. Uh, which, now, I don't know the direction of this. Are we sensitive to the motion because we think it may be the source of people, or are we looking at people which happen to be sources of motion? Um, but we, we do know that those two things are linked. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is an insight that filmmakers have, obviously. Uh, if, you, if you just take a sample of all frames in all film and TV, you'll see that um, the majority of the frames are actually uh, depicting human form in motion. Um, this is a, an art project by uh, Brendan Dawes called Cinema Redux, where he compresses movies down to a, a, a series of frames. Um, this is a bit blurry, but uh, basically this is a giant montage of all the frames. And what, what comes out is all these faces and close-ups from the shot. Uh, and this is something that Hitchcock also says when he's being very modest about his art. He says that his principal task as a director is the organization of these oval shapes within the rectangle of the screen. Um, basically, that's what he's reducing his choice of composition down. You have to put faces, you've got to put them somewhere. What do you do with that? Um, so he's saying that we're attracted to, um, to people. Uh, in order to communicate something, you have to build on that, and you have to follow where people are going to look when they're looking at social scenes, and therefore you can choose what to cut to when. So going back to um, eye tracking, uh, this, we've known this since the very beginning. Um, Alfred Jarvis, in his famous example of um, eye tracking whilst looking at a painting, this is um, Rapin's uh, The Unexpected Visitor. If ever you read any textbook that says this is eye tracking, they'll show this. Um, we've moved on slightly since then, but the basic principles are the same. Um, this is the raw trace of the eye movements. Um, nicely, this is actually uh, produced by a participant who's wearing a contact lens with a, with a little reflector on it. Um, the eyes had to be anesthetized so that they could actually stabilize the head relative to the camera so they could track these traces. Um, that's how we used to do eye tracking before we had uh, high-speed infrared cameras. Um, and this little kind of like this vertical bit here and the, cl the cluster matches onto the man and his outfit. And most of the knots of this trace are people's faces in the scene. Um, and in this example, uh, he manipulated viewing instructions and he could show that your gaze would change where they were looking in an image. Um, and here's another example. When the, the shot gets closer, when the image gets closer, you do this characteristic scan path where you're doing a triangle between the eyes and the mouth. Um, and you here, um, he also showed that people trace the outline of the face, but you almost never get that if you're, uh, if you're giving a free viewing task for participants. I think in his example, they were staring at this thing for minutes at a time, so why don't you stop doing that? Um, so in, from very early, we could see that people are looking at faces. Um, they're so much so that uh, you can, when you give people a social scene, not only the faces, but the eye region is going to account for a lot of the gaze location of viewers when looking at scenes. Um, and they're not just looking at these regions in isolation, they're mapping out the social intention and the social interaction in the scene. So here's a nice um, demonstration from uh, John Henderson's lab. Uh, you can see the cluster of gaze, and this was a still image. Uh, it was like a, a, a sequence of photographs of somebody going into an office and robbing some stuff. Um, so there's no motion in here, but you can see that gaze is mostly on the face, looking at the hands, and you get this uh, kind of gaze following where you're looking at what this person is doing backwards and forwards, almost as if they're shooting lasers from their eyes. Um, so we're looking at the face, we're looking at the face in interaction with the things. In the same way that I showed in the Posner example, gaze queuing can actually distribute our attention away from a face to a target of interest. <clears throat> and this happens in movies as well. So when I'm watching people in interaction, this is the gaze behavior of someone who's uh, listening to the audio and um, interested in the characters. So there are several interesting things here. Um, they're, they're not told to just follow the, the narrative. They're told to remember as much of the scene as possible. Um, they do very few excursions into the periphery. Uh, they're mostly just looking at the faces. They're trying to read they're trying to understand what's being said, maybe doing some lip reading, maybe doing some kind of facial expression analysis. Notice they're not looking at the gestures. That's quite common. Um, even people who are uh, reading subtitles, they tend not to look at gestures. You tend to monitor it covertly. Um, unless they actually interact with an object, and then it may go down to the hands. Uh, also, what I've got here is the two eyes. 
Um, most eye tracking studies won't show you the two eyes. Um, this one is useful because it shows that actually the two eyes don't point in the same place. Um, either due to eye tracker error or our inability of actually stabilizing our points in the image. The eyes tend to be quite dynamic in the way they'll move relative to each other, with one of the eyes being dominant and actually leading the other one. <clears throat> so, um, is visual attention a motivation for editing in a scene? Uh, well, Ernst Lindgren, the, uh, the director and film theorist, says that actually the attention is the fundamental psychological motivation for editing, uh, because the parts of the scene we're going to focus on our attention to uh, are the ones which I want to show you in detail. So if I've got a long, uh, a medium long shot of these two people in interaction, just like the scene I showed you there, and I want to show you more detail, then I can coincide my uh, cuts to close-ups of their faces um, at the point that you would actually shift your attention to them, and therefore my editing pattern is going to mirror your shifts of attention. Not only that, but it's going to become hyper-real, because I'm going to give you something you can't do in reality. I'm going to transport you closer to the target and rotate your angle so I can actually show more of the face, the facial expression, the intention, in a way that when you're just looking at the scene remotely, your visual system is too limited to do that for you. So I'm actually creating a kind of a hyper-real stimulus, creating um, close-ups of the details that you're interested in. <clears throat> now, can we see this actually uh, evolve over time? So as I said, filmmakers have intuited this, and they started to refine it uh, throughout the history of, of cinema. Um, and you can see that refining process and the optimization process if you look at the history of, um, of editing. Um, I'm going to show you some stats on this later from uh, James Cutting's wonderful work. But I think this is a really nice example. Um, this is a film, Shop Around the Corner. It's a really classic screwball comedy by Ernst Lubitsch from 1940. <coughs> Um, this is the story, has anybody seen this film? Mm -hmm. The film theorists. Um, they know what I'm going to say about this, so don't give it away. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is Jimmy Stewart and Margaret Sullivan. They both work in this department store. Um, they basically, they're like cat and dog. They're at each other all the time. They hate working together. They despise the ground that each one walks on. Um, and they despise their jobs in general. But they have this secret life that in the evenings they have a pen pal that they write to and they're developing this blossoming relationship. Um, and they uh, suddenly decide that, okay, we need to meet. Uh, they've never met this person. In, uh, they've never met in person. They've just been exchanging letters. And they don't even know who this person is. So they arrange to meet in this cafe. Um, and uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart comes to this cafe and unbeknownst that the other woman is actually his pen pal, the one that he's been uh, bickering with the whole time. Uh, and before he gets into the cafe, he gets a friend to look through the window to see if she's attractive enough for him to bother going in. Uh, this is 1940. Um, <laughs> and his friend says, well, she's certainly attractive enough, but I don't think you're going to like it because she's that girl from work that you hate. Um, so he, being really mean, comes in and torments her and doesn't reveal who he is and basically uh, winds her up about the fact that her date hasn't shown up. And it's this wonderful, wonderful snappy dialogue sequence. Um, this whole nine-minute sequence has 20 shots in it in 1940. The average shot length is 27 seconds. That's incredibly long for anybody who knows film and TV. But if you watch this, you wouldn't see it as being slow paced because the drama is so intense. This film was remade in the 90s. Does anybody know what film it was remade as? You've Got Me. You've Got Me. Yeah. So it was remade as You've Got Mail by Nora Ephron with Tom Hanks and uh, Meg Ryan. Uh, What's great about this scene, and I have to give full credit to this analysis to David Bordwell, who realized um, that we can do this, the duration of the two scenes and the basic beats of action are identical across the two movies. Nine minutes in duration, but now going 50 years in the future, um, there's 134 shots over the same duration. The average shot duration is four seconds to tell the same story. And when you actually create a matrix of the shots, what you start to see is how um, systematic the camera placements are. So, uh, just drop it. <clears throat> so you can see the pattern of editing that I pointed out. So this is an establishing shot of the two locations, left and right, and cut to an over-the-shoulder shot as Meg speaks, cut to the opposite over-the-shoulder shot as Tom speaks, backwards and forwards, over and over again. Move the camera in closer when it intensifies with the drama to give more significance to what's being said. Pull the camera back if they change location. You can build an algorithm to generate this. 
and those, that code does actually exist. Um, and this is basically an operalization and an optimization of the 180 degree system. <clears throat> so this technique that filmmakers had, had intuitive about where people are going to look becomes optimized and optimized to the point where we're getting this incredibly systematic way of, of shooting scenes. Um, you can see this if you actually do statistical analysis of film form over time. Um, this is the great work of James Cutting uh, from Cornell. Um, this is the average shot length as it's decreased over, this was initially 120 movies that he analyzed. He and his students went through these feature films and codified all of the features of the movie. So they found exactly when the cuts were. And he also operationalized how much motion was in the image, what the brightness was, what the shot size, and various other factors. Uh, and you can see that there's a significant linear decrease in the average shot duration going from about 10 seconds in 1930 uh, down to about three and a half seconds in uh, the first decade of this century. The visual activity, so the amount of motion that's in the image, is also increasing significantly, um, where you're getting a lot more change in the image. The correlation between the shot length and the visual activity is also increasing, so that you're getting smaller shots with more motion. Um, why, why do people think we've got a lot more shots, that, the closer shots that have more motion in them now than we had 20 or 30 years ago? Just think about how would I create a really tight shot with lots of movement in it? Filmmakers want to come? Yeah. Um, well, I'm thinking camera technology has, yeah. obviously, you have thick reels. Yeah. In 1930s, a camera was this massive thing with big film reels. It was on a, a, a tripod that had to be moved and couldn't be physically carried. And as, uh, and then in the 1980s, the late 70s and 80s, you've got um, handheld cameras, miniaturization of the cameras. And then the 90s and the, the noughties, you start to get digitization where the cameras get a lot smaller. Um, on top of that, you get Steadicam, which gets introduced in the 70s. Um, Steadicam enables somebody to become the entire camera rig, and they're able to move with the action. And so even that um, cookery show I showed you before, that's handheld camera work, most of it. It doesn't need to be, but the consequence is that when you've got a tight shot, there's a lot of things moving in the image. So more, more motion, closer shots, also darker image. If anybody goes to the cinema and gets really annoyed because they can't see where, what's in the image, that's because film, filmmakers seem to think that dark is good. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, what's up, this doesn't show is also contrast range is also increasing. So as uh, camera technology, as digital sensors get better with high dynamic range, you're getting higher contrast. So you get a darker overall image, but you get higher points of contrast, which are believed to actually capture attention. Um, and these patterns also, so this is his original data set where he did hand coding. And this is a, a recent paper that just came out where they have 9,300 movies that have been coded in their entirety. Um, from, from 1900 uh, to the late 1920s, you have this sudden decrease in the shot duration. And then it goes up again, and then you've got a, a linear decrease to um, now. Uh, anybody, any idea what happened here? Color? No. Oh. Yes. Why did, um, why did the introduction of sync sound mean that they had to decrease shot duration? They had to increase shot duration. Because the more they conveyed the message with the text, mm. so the duration yep. was the duration that people took to read and not to... Yeah, but actually these, these have been coded without um, the intertitles. But you're right, because they didn't have to go at the pace of dialogue. Because they would say, okay, now you understand what they're saying, otherwise it's in the image. Um, this was... It's more difficult to edit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, much there's in, uh, both sound on disk and sound on film systems. Uh, mm -hmm. Sound on disk system was incredible. Uh, very difficult to edit. Yeah. And sound also to shoot it because the, the film cameras were really noisy themselves. So often what they'd have to do is shoot through a booth. They basically put the camera in a box, shoot through a window to where the action was, which meant that the camera couldn't move as much. So they had to stage more of it in front of the camera. So it completely changed the aesthetic. If anybody's interested in these formal features of film, look at some of the late 20s um, films like um, Murnau's Sunrise or um, uh, Diga Berthold's Man in the Movie Camera. Beautiful, beautiful visual effects which basically pre-shadow uh, pre MTV and their editing complexity. 
And then that just got lost in Hollywood because everything became about the audio. Anyway, let's <coughs> start moving on. Um, so in my work, I've been looking at these techniques as the sensitivity to social features and shifting with social cues as a way of understanding the breakdown of scenes. Um, and you can see this if you look at um, films within kind of classic Hollywood tradition where they're adhering to this system. You've got placements, you've got continuation of motion, you've got people introduced, dialogue shifts backwards and forwards, glances, cueing attention. Even the owl returned his gaze there as a way of cueing attention. Uh, and predominant interest on the faces and the form in motion. <coughs> um, so you can predict highly where people are going to look just by identifying the motion in the image and also where the faces are. <coughs> um, and we can see that actually the gaze is shifting with the social events. So this is, um, uh, this is a study I did with Melissa Vogue. Uh, we recorded eye movements when they were looking at this video of street scenes. And um, within it, you can see that the gaze is mostly clustered around the center of the face, but the dynamics is moving within it. Um, so we take these long sequences and we break it down into events that share some basic features. So we can see what dynamics are actually influencing where people are looking. Um, and if you remember the Yarbos example I showed before with the triangle of the gaze, if you're looking at a still face, what you predominantly do is you look between the eyes and you look down at the mouth. Now, if you're looking at a movie of a face, you do something slightly different, which is the proportion of time spent looking at the nose is as high as any of the other two regions. Uh, and we think partly that's because it's a stabilization of this moving object. You don't know what the head's going to go to. So you're optimizing your perception by being in the middle. And then you make digressions up to the areas of interest. If you want to perceive emotion in a moment and the head's stable enough, you go up to the eyes. If you're not understanding what they're saying, you move down to the mouth. Um, and we've got in the paper, we've got uh, different events that actually show how the dynamics change. So here, this is when there's one person on the scene, you're listening to the audio, um, and we've got eye contact. If they're not making eye contact with the camera, you are predominantly looking at the mouth and the nose when you're listening to them. And then when they make eye contact, you get this increase in the looking to the eyes. So they look at you, you look at them. Um, and this interacts with the audio so that when you're... Uh, when you can't hear them, you're not looking at the mouth so much and you're looking, focusing up at the eyes. And so even within the face, you can see these kind of microdynamics that are shifting where you're looking. Um, and this relationship between the face and the gaze is highly predictive of where people are looking. When you're defining shot size, you're doing it relative to the human form. So if you say that a long shot is a shot which, if the person in it was butted up against the top of the image, their entire body can be seen. Uh, and then a close shot is typically a, a whole face would just be seen and fill the whole image. Um, and the shot size predicts how clustered your gaze is. So this is um, basically the, how much of the image is occupied by uh, multiple viewers' gaze in that frame. Um, smaller is better, means they're more tight. Um, if you have no people in the frame, you have a lot more uh, divergence where people are looking. As soon as you have at least one character in the frame, even if they're tiny, gaze gets more clustered and becomes tighter and tighter all the way to a close medium shot. Um, and this is sometimes called the plan American. It's a very common uh, composition where you'll see this in all news reports, all documentaries. No? It's not a plan American. It goes down to the ankle. Okay, not a Pan American. Um, but this is very common. This is used in all kind of documentaries and, and news stories. And this is how tight. And also look where the gaze is clustered. It's on the person's nose. And um, if you think about the visual angle, which is actually occupied by this, it's mostly foveal and parafoveal region. So it's the most sensitive part of your vision, meaning you can actually see most of the face without moving your eyes too much, depending on how big the image is. And then it goes back up again. So as the camera gets too close to the face, all of a sudden the gaze starts spreading out. Now that is, again, because this object is filling more of your visual field, meaning that you can no longer process all of it just by holding fixation. Due to visual acuity problems, you have to then saccade. So I'm looking at the left eye, I'm looking at the right eye, I'm looking at the mouth. It breaks it down into objects of interest and my gaze has to explore it. And so having a shot like this is highly predictive of where people are going to look. There's only one face. Um, knowing where people are looking means, of course, that we can 
violate it intentionally. Um, so there are many filmmakers, there are many film styles that don't, uh, don't try to control and make systematic viewing patterns or comprehension patterns in film. This is uh, a sequence from uh, Lars von Trier's uh, Dancer in the Dark, uh, which came out of his experiments and other Danish filmmakers' experiments in the dogma, um, where it was more rough and ready, it was less adhering to continuity tradition, and what you can see is how exploratory the gaze is. There's a lot of um, handheld camera work here. Uh, can you flip the lights off? <clears throat> so. The relationship from one shot to the next is really unclear. You don't know where they are spatially relevant to each other, temporally, causally connected. Um, all of a sudden you just jump into, into the interior from the exterior. You're constantly reacting to what's happening. You're still looking for the same point. You're trying to find her face. You're trying to find her interacting with other characters. Um, but because you don't know where they are and you can't anticipate them, your viewing of this is a lot more erratic. Um, so much so that with the unsteady camera, often what happens is the gaze is actually outside of the screen. You're looking at the screen edge because you're being tracked into an area where um, you didn't expect an object to go. So the gaze can become a lot more active. And for a filmmaker, this can, of course, be very uh, key to and part of his um, storytelling toolkit. Right? Dance from the Dark is a very traumatic movie. And he wants to unnerve the viewer. And so choosing this aesthetic can be one way of actually doing that in your immediate reception of the image. Uh, okay. Thanks. <coughs> Way to keep you awake. Um, how much longer can I talk? <coughs> I'm going to talk for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good. Ten minutes. Okay. Um, so what I've shown so far is that some of the insights that filmmakers have um, seem to be based on the way that we're actually passing visual scenes with our visual attention. Um, and of course, this begs the question of, like, does it mean, just because I'm looking in the same place, that I'm seeing and I'm perceiving the same thing? Now, we've already talked about the dissociation between attention, covert, overt, and the relationship between sensitivity and perception, that it's not an, an absolute relationship. Um, so what evidence is there that film can actually unify multiple levels of processing? Well, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but um, if you want to know more about this, look at the work of Yuri Hassan and his team. Um, he has done a whole series of studies where he's looked at people watching movies uh, in an MRI, and uh, what they do is they, they get people free viewing movies, like his famous examples from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, um, and then they align the cortical maps from multiple people into a common reference frame, and then they correlate the voxel activity from one person to the next. Um, and when you do that, what you find is that 45% um, of the cortex shows significant intersubject correlation. Um, that's a remarkable amount of brain activity which is actually accounted for between different people when they're just looking at the same scene. Now, it's primarily primary sensory areas, auditory cortex and the visual cortex, but there's also areas responsible for language and for kind of mid to high level object features. So we can do this in different parts of the brain, um, so if you look in the fusiform gyrus, not surprisingly, when there's close-ups or where a face occupies most of the image, you get high synchronization uh, th in the fusiform face area across individuals. Um, areas which are focused on places and building processing, you get the same pattern. And uh, hands and manipulation, you post central sulcus, you get uh, synchronization at the moments where you see the hands in interaction. Um, now, in unrelated work, this technique has been used to actually do brain decoding. We can predict features in movies from brain activity by knowing these peaks in different, um, uh, different brain areas. And so this suggests that it's not just m looking in the same place, but for movies, you've got a lot of uh, other levels of processing which also synchronize across individuals. Um, so what is, the, what is the, the opportunity for all these factors? For whatever reason, people are looking in the same place, and a lot of the basic processing is happening systematically across individuals. Um, what factors can we see that are actually pushing individual differences? Um, so it could be actual individual differences, something about me that distinguishes me from you. Um, I could change the viewing task, or I could change um, how what people are actually thinking whilst they're watching it. I'm going to skip some stuff. I'll show you this. Um, this is what a, an adult with autism does when he's looking at that same scene before. Um, so this is his gaze, the purple thing, moving around all over the place. And it's just immediately apparent without even quantifying this. 
I, t I gave him the task of process of remembering all the details in the scene, and so he does that. He looks at the whole scene. Um, he tries to follow the features, but also notice he's doing a lot of kind of gestural tracking, which is something that the uh, neurotypical adults don't do. <clears throat> so he's been viewing that scene differently, which means that a film which was edited for him would have to be composed differently to a neurotypical adult. Skip that. Um, what about how I'm, co I'm comprehending a scene? How does that relate to where I'm looking? Uh, in other work by Yuri Hasson, he looked at uh, the clustering of gaze in different types of composed sequences. So if you compare the gaze clustering in Good, the Bad and the Ugly to, uh, this is a shot of Washington Square Park, no edits, static camera, random things happening in front of it, you've got a lot more dispersal of gaze, um, as I showed before, and you still do get moments of clustering, but a lot less than when it's highly edited and composed, and also the intersubject correlation of brain activity um, also changes based on the composition. So if I have an Alfred Hitchcock film, you have 65% uh, of the cortex is correlated when you're watching Hitchcock. Um, Sergi Lahoni is 45%, um, percent. Larry David, A Curb Your Enthusiasm is 20%, and just this video of Washington State Square, uh, State, uh, Square is down to less than 5%. So it highly depends on what they're actually doing. Well, what um, do you mean with correlated? Correlated with other areas or between subjects? Between subjects. So it's inter-subject correlation. You can also look for network pa patterns here, the relationship between them. Um, so these are the, the distribution of the correlations. It's literally saying, does your fusiform gyrus correlate with someone else's? Um, and he's done work on individual differences of autism and neurotypicals and looking for those differences. Uh, but what's important here is that it seems like there's less opportunity for individual differences when it's highly composed, because you're all looking in the same place. And that's what we've looked at, just as my final study, uh, in a, a study with um, Lester Loschke and Joe Magliano. And um, we wanted to see, using a highly edited sequence, can I change your comprehension? And does that change your eye movements in a scene? So this is uh, a scene from the opening of um, James Bond Moonraker. Uh, this is Jaws. Jaws and Bond have just wrestled midair as they jumped out of a plane together. Um, Bond managed to, to uh, get someone's uh, parachute and has just um, parachuted off. And Jaws is just about to pull his ripcord so he can uh, parachute to safety. And he realizes, oh dear, it's snapped. And then it's, it's floating around and all of a sudden you get this completely unrelated shot of the circus tent. And you collect the flap, because that's going to help. And then you go to inside the circus tent. Now, this is a common editing, um, cross-cutting technique. You see something which is completely unrelated, you're motivated to try and figure out what's the relationship between the two shots. Um, what, what do people think is going to happen next? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Turns out undergraduate psychology students at the University of Kansas don't always make that prediction, which is handy, because if they did, we wouldn't have any effect. Um, so what we did is we showed participants this sequence, either in isolation, uh, or they saw the preceding two minutes of footage. Uh, yeah, the preceding three minutes of footage. The preceding three minutes don't tell them about the circus tent, but it builds up this kind of this narrative context in which they can then hopefully be better at the prediction. And if you ask them after the clip what happens next, 91% that see the whole context say that he's going to fall on the circus tent. Uh, only 71% say he's going to fall on the circus tent if you just see the six shots. Um, there's various reasons for that, but what's important is that the mental model they've got of the sequence as they're watching it differs. We can see that um, in the, the, those individuals that make the inference and those that don't. So does that manifest in their eye movements? <clears throat> and how can we look at that? Well, we don't want to do a region of interest analysis um, because we don't really know in this complex scene what's relevant. We just want to see, does the gaze tell us that they're looking in a different place? So. I've got the heat maps here of the gaze. Um, this is the no context condition where they didn't make the inference. This is the no context condition when they did make the inference. And this is the context condition where they did make the inference. So there may be differences between this one and these two. And there may be differences between this one and these two, if inference is having an effect on where they're looking. And if I play the heat map. Different participants with different mental models of the scene. Pretty much looking in exactly the same place. 
Do people agree it's very hard to find differences there? Um, <clears throat> so we can quantify how similar these are by using the heat maps as a probabilistic distribution and seeing whether they differ to each other. Um, so this is a technique similar to what um, we were talking about Josh with before, where you plot the heat map for every frame and you're seeing how well does this heat map, which is a context plus inference, account for the gaze behavior in the other three conditions. And it will give you a score where if they differ, it means that there's some divergence in the heat map. Ignore the first frame because in the context condition, um, they started with more things happening before. So you're just looking in, these are, uh, these are the shots that came afterwards. And the critical shot we're interested in is when you've got a sudden introduction of the big top. And as you see that, you know that um, some of the participants are going to be drawing the inference that um, it's related to, um, to jaws and he's going to fall on it, and others aren't. And when we look at how, close, how well the gaze is actually similar, you see that the context condition, that has more clustering of gaze than in the other two, where they start exploring the image. Um, so we've got a difference based on what previous knowledge they've got, but we don't have a difference in terms of the inference. There's no difference between these two here. So the gaze is telling us that this frame is critical, um, but it, it's partly distingu the distinguishing between um, what is in the mental model, but not what inferences they're making. Mm -hmm. um, and because we're doing this probabilistic, we can do it for every frame of the movie. So you can see these patterns of gaze all moving together. The higher the value, the more clustered they are. The lower, the more dispersed they are. And if they separate, it means they're looking in different places. And again, you can see this dispersal. That initially, they all look in the same place. And then the context stays looking in the same place. And the other two conditions start exploring the image. So we can use the gaze to say this is a moment of interest. And it relates to the mental model that we've asked them after the fact. Um, but it's intriguing that it doesn't distinguish between the actual inference process itself. So that's basic example of how difficult it is to get individual differences uh, in movies. So many of the factors seem to be focusing attention to one place and creating a lot of synchronization of the where we're looking but also what we're processing. Um, and sometimes you can create differences in higher level representation of the scene uh, but generally they won't manifest in the actual uh, place that you're looking in the image because you're being focused by the dynamics of the editing itself. Um, and that's why I think that it's interesting from a cognitive science perspective to look at movies because we can think of it as this, ch uh, this um, medium where it's trying to communicate a particular idea through the medium itself to the viewer. And so by understanding all these different levels of the process, we can start to understand both the medium, the intention of the uh, director, as well as the mind of the viewer in more detail. And 